Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we start with number one from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action they are taking to improve the accessibility of childminders for all families. Minister Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We recognise the valuable contribution that childminders can and do make to the provision of high quality early learning and childcare, which is accessible and affordable for all families. We fund the Scottish Childminding Association and enable it to promote childminding services through its work with local authorities. Our blueprint for action makes clear that we expect childminders and community childminders to play a significant role in the expansion of funded early learning and childcare to 1140 hours. To help achieve this, we've worked with the Care Inspectorate to develop a resource to support childminders to enhance the quality of care they provide through formal and informal learning opportunities. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for that response. Earlier this week, the ex Chief Executive of Scottish Childminers Association highlighted how childminers are being excluded from local authority plans to deliver funded childcare. The most recent figures from the Care Inspectorate have indicated that 23% of local authority nurseries can provide care for two-year-olds, whereas 92% uh, for childminders themselves. Can I ask the Minister to comment on what action they are taking to recognise the vital role childminders play and ensure they are closely integrated to ensure that they can and do deal with the funding for childcare hours? Minister. Thank you. Um, we, we absolutely know that childminders provide high quality early learning and childcare. Um, childminders and community childminders have an important role to play in delivering the expanded entitlement. Through our review of the local authority ELC expansion plans and in response to the latest figures produced by the Scottish Childminding Association on the current use of childminders in providing funded ELC, we have committed to working with local authorities, SEMA and individual childminders to identify any barriers to commissioning childminding services. We'll work together to address and remove those barriers, building on learning from the national programme of 1140 hours. Of the 14 Scottish Government trials, 10 involved childminders. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, local authorities rely on par partners in the private and voluntary sectors to deliver preschool education and have a duty to fund these from the General Revenue Grant. Does the Minister share the concerns expressed by some childminders and private and voluntary nurseries that some local authorities, such as North Ayrshire, refuse to fund them to the same degree as council-run nurseries and that in doing so they may be at risk of creating a level of unfair advantage for their own nurseries whilst diminishing parental choice locally? Sir. We have been very clear that our approach to the transformation of early learning and childcare is provider neutral. We'll create a new funding follows the child model for introduction in 2020. This new model will prioritise the settings that are best placed to deliver quality outcomes for children, regardless of which sector they are provided by, while offering parents a greater choice of settings. Together with our living wage commitment for childcare workers delivering the funded entitlement, this will support financially sustainable early learning and childcare provision across all sectors. To support providers, we will also introduce a new 100% business rates relief for day nurseries from April 2018. Daniel Johnson. Presiding officer, the number of childminders has fallen sharply, 400 since December 2015. We also know that the number of people graduating from childcare courses fell last year. And given the expansion of, of childcare is going to need more staff at all levels, will the minister guarantee that there will be more childminders and more childcare graduates by this time next year? Minister. Yes, we're absolutely committed to increasing the number of qualified childminders. We've increased the number of college places for childminding and we will be uh, delivering on the promises that we have made with our regard to ELC. Thank you. Question number two, Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the power in the Private Housing Tenancies Scotland Act 2016 to designate rent pressure zones will come into force. Minister Kevin Stewart. <laughs> Presiding Officer, the Private Housing Tenancies Scotland Act 2016 uh, will come into force on the 1st of December 2017. From tomorrow, local authorities will be able to make an application to Scottish ministers for an area to be designated as a rent pressure zone. Ben McPherson. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. 
Given that rents in Edinburgh have risen significantly in recent years, does, does the Minister agree with me that the potential designation of rent pressure zones in Edinburgh merits serious consideration? And to that end, can the Minister outline what guidance is in place to help Edinburgh City Council and other local authorities to take forward applications to propose that certain areas be designated as rent pressure zones? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Um, rent pressure zones are, uh, provisions are a valuable discretionary tool for councils. Uh, they must decide themselves whether it's appropriate to submit an application based on their knowledge of the local area. On the 16th of November, we published the rent pressure zone requirements for local authorities. Uh, and this document outlines the requirements that a council must uh, meet for its application to be valid. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, have any councils shown an early interest in setting up rent pressure zones? If so, which? On what grounds and in which areas? Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, as I uh, gave uh, in my previous answer, uh, this only comes into force uh, tomorrow. Now, I've read some media reports, as probably other members have, uh, about certain local authorities uh, looking uh, at the possibility of rent pressure zones for their areas. But I will wait um, till their applications come in uh, and then the government will look at those applications very closely indeed. Polly McNeill. Thank you. I welcome the Minister's statement today. Um, in the guidance that will be issued, uh, will local authorities be given an uh, indication of the scope of evidence that would be required to make an application to be considered as a rent uh, pressured zone? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the document that I mentioned before, uh, rent pressure zone requirements for local authorities, uh, goes into some depth, and I would expect local authorities uh, to pour over that document uh, and act accordingly in, with their submissions. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what level of input it had to the design of the Asylum Accommodation and Support Services contract which was issued for tender by the UK Government on 21st of November this year. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Signing off, sir, I wrote to the Immigration Minister on the 2nd of March 2017 to set out the Scottish Government's very detailed priorities for the next asylum accommodation contract and also raised this issue during my meeting uh, with the Immigration Minister on the 12th of July uh, this year also. Scottish Government officials have taken part in a number of engagement events with members of the Home Office's Asylum Accommodation and Support Transformation Project team uh, since autumn 2016. Uh, and I have to say to the member, I have not been satisfied with the operation of the current contract and have made it clear that I wanted to be involved in the development of the next contract to ensure that it meets the needs of asylum seekers in Scotland. It is therefore extremely disappointing that the Home Office have gone ahead and published the contract notice without discussion and without a clear commitment to integration support. And I have written to the Immigration Minister this week to express my deep concerns about this process. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. No one should be satisfied with the current level of provision of asylum accommodation and support services. Uh, the UK's Home Affairs Select Committee, amongst many others, have condemned the level of provision uh, that's provided by multinational corporations on a for-profit basis uh, under the, the current contract. This new contract will set the terms under which these services are provided for the next 10 years. It's one of the biggest contracts the UK government lets, uh, some four billion pounds, half a billion of which will be spent in Scotland over that decade. Uh, it's important that we get this right rather than repeating the mistakes of the past. Has the Scottish Government indicated a, a desire to the UK Government to put together a public sector-led bid to take on Lot 5, which covers Scotland? If it hasn't, will it? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm grateful to Mr Harvey for his uh, question. Uh, I have written uh, at least on three occasions uh, to the UK Government in and around concerns around the current contract and also in my meetings uh, now with two immigration ministers have raised the point about the desirability uh, of a public sector-led uh, uh, contract. And despite the um, 
verbal assurance that uh, the Home Office were open to uh, a range of ideas. Uh, like <coughs> Mr Harvey, I am disappointed uh, that the, the Home Office and the Immigration Minister uh, in particular have not responded to the very detailed points and indeed have ignored uh, many of the points uh, raised by the, the Home Affairs Committee, not least the need to recognise uh, devolved administrations uh, as partners. In terms of the work that this government will lead, we uh, will obviously continue uh, to work with our stakeholders uh, in the third sector. Uh, we continue to uh, have discussions with other devolved administrations, namely the Welsh, uh, COSLA, an important partner here, as indeed our uh, Glasgow City Council. But the crucial issue here is that for any organisation, any third sector uh, or public sector organisation, uh, they will have to satisfy themselves that they can provide a quality service uh, to vulnerable people within the budget that the Home Office uh, have now set. And that's the absolutely uh, critical point. And for the avoidance of doubt, this government has always been very clear that the provision uh, of asylum accommodation and support uh, should be led by the third sector or the public sector and not by those who have profit as a motive. Question number four, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the action it has taken to manage flood risk in the south of Scotland. Minister Hamza Youssef. Local authorities, Scottish Water, Forestry, Commission Scotland and SEPA are taking forward actions to manage flood risk in the south of Scotland as set out by the relevant flood risk management strategies and indeed the local plans. Emma Harper. Thank you. Um, can the Minister... Uh, reassure constituents in the south of Scotland that local authorities have the necessary powers and resources to regularly reflect upon and, if necessary, update flood defence plans in response to feedback from communities regarding measures currently in place? Minister. I can give that reassurance. The Flood Risk Management Act sets out a six-year cycle for delivering flood risk management strategies and local plans, which are implemented by councils and other responsible authorities. The first set of strategies and local action plans were published in 2015 and 2016. The focus of action is in areas where the risk of flooding and the benefits on, uh, of investment are greatest. Uh, planning for the second cycle is currently underway and new evidence, information and lessons learned will be taken into account when developing new strategies and local plans. Uh, as set out in the Act, there will be consultation, uh, therefore enabling communities to provide very specific feedback on flood protection measures that affect them. Question number five, Claire Hockey. The presiding officer to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to ensure that new build housing estates are able to access fast fibre broadband internet connections. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, presiding officer, despite telecoms delivery being a reserve matter, the Scottish Government has taken steps to assist with rollout of broadband during housing construction. From the 1st of January this year, amendments to the Building Scotland Regulations 2004 set a standard for in building physical infrastructure for high-speed electronic communications networks. This enables easier installation of fibre at any time on or after completion and applies to new homes and other buildings. In new build developments, where there is a commercial demand for superfast broadband, we would expect that this would be delivered commercially without the need for public funding. Clear hockey. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I have been contacted by numerous constituents in the Newton Farm area of my constituency regarding poor broadband speeds that they are able to access in their homes. Most of the area is new built housing and the estate continues to expand. Developers have not provided the infrastructure to allow residents to access reasonable broadband speeds and there appears to be no onus on developers by local authorities at the planning stage to ensure infrastructure is adequate to deal with the demands on internet speeds. Can the Minister uh, advise me uh, what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure local authorities take connectivity needs into account when approving housing developments? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the, the planning system cannot require delivery of infrastructure by third parties. That's not what it's for. But it does encourage developers to agree with infrastructure providers to build in coverage and capacity new developments. And as I've said, the building standards applicable from this year basically require that physical infrastructure is in place, and that's usually ducts or cable trays in buildings ready to receive fibre or cables for broadband for new single and multiple occupancy buildings. Presiding officer, last week I raised this with the chief executive of BT Openreach and the senior, the top uh, officer of BT in Scotland. I urged them to go further than their pledge at the moment, which is uh, to enable connection to 
uh, fibre broadband for developments of uh, 30 or more houses. I asked them to go further than that and consider developments of under 30 houses, uh, and they told me that they're giving sympathetic consideration of that. So uh, the Scottish Government is very much pressing for further progress in addition to the higher regulation that we introduced at the beginning of this year designed to help uh, the members' constituents and other constituents around the whole country. Morris Golden. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that Scotland is behind every single English local authority, the Welsh Government and Northern Ireland, in its approach to phase two of the superfast broadband rollout? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have veered off building regulations and planning, but let me reply quite directly to this. The claims persistently made by UK ministers and Tory MPs this week that Scotland is three years behind of the rest of the UK are entirely false. <laughs> Moreover, saying after over 800,000 homes and businesses across Scotland now have access to fibre broadband as a result of the Digital Scotland Superfast programme. Uh, that programme uh, was an investment of over £400 million. It has been recognised by independent commentators and regulators such as Ofcom uh, that Scotland is ahead of the rest of the UK in the speed <laughs> of, uh, of equipping people with access to broadband. Uh, and indeed, when I met Mr Hancock on Monday, he agreed that our approach is the correct one and he will cooperate with us. So he said anyway, we will wait and see how, if that cooperation uh, uh, materialises, but he undertook to cooperate with the Scottish Government as our plans go forward for the final stage uh, of broadband connection, bearing in mind that we have an undertaking to connect everybody to enable them to access superfast broadband down south, down south, uh, the UK government have made and apparently are not going to make any such commitment. Question number six, Colin Smith. President officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with ScotRail regarding ticket price anomalies on the Nith Valley Line and the West Coast Main Line. Minister Abzi Yusuf. Transport Scotland meets with uh, ScotRail as do I on a regular basis to discuss franchise matters including rail fares. Uh, no reports have been received uh, yet concerning ticket price anomalies on the Nith Valley Line and West Coast Main Line. However, where fare anomalies are identified, ScotRail will be asked to take appropriate action as required and as specified in the franchise agreement. Colin Smith. I thank the Minister for that answer, though it is a bit surprising given that when I was a councillor I raised this issue with his predecessor. Yeah. Is the Minister aware of the extent to which passengers in Dumfries and Galloway are being ripped off when it comes to rail fares? I'll give him two quick examples. A passenger who travels the 50-mile trip to Glasgow from Kirkconnell in the Nith Valley Line will pay £13.50 for a single. That's 27p per mile. But if they drive a few miles north out with Dumfries and Galloway and catch the train in New Conduct, they pay £8.40, just 19p per mile for the 43-mile trip. Passengers on 28 commuter routes across Scotland benefit from ScotRail's FlexiPass ticket that allows discounts for regular users, but this discount isn't available anywhere in Dumfries and Galloway, including the region's busiest commuter route from Lockerbie Station to Edinburgh in Glasgow. How can the government say they're committed to tackling the economic challenges facing Dumfries and Galloway, one of the lowest wage regions in Scotland, when these anomalies make it more expensive from passengers from the region to use our railways to get to work? Minister. Can I, say to the on the, can I say to the member on the specific of the anomaly uh, that he suggests exists, of course I will have a look at that. And as I say, there is a mechanism uh, within the, the franchise agreement for ScotRail to rectify that. So I will uh, most certainly have a look. In terms of uh, fares, uh, I absolutely agree that uh, passengers and commuters uh, need to have, uh, of course, fair and affordable access to rail. That is why this Scottish Government has taken action in relation to fare rises. They are capped here in Scotland and therefore are lower than the rest of the United Kingdom. So we'll continue to take that action, continue to drive up performance. In the meantime, of course, to be constructive and helpful, I will, of course, take away the fare anomaly that he suggested exists and see if that can be rectified by ScotRail. Question number seven, Adam Tompkins. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how the Lord Advocate decides whether a matter is in the public interest. Lord Advocate. Sorry, Lord Advocate, I think we need a card here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That's quite understandable. Thank you. Yeah, there we are. Yes. Thank you. Lord Thank Advocate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, I'm grateful to Mr. Tompkins for the rare opportunity to uh, uh, use, use my card and answer a question. Um, this is a question which concerns my functions as head of the system of prosecution. Uh, assessing whether it is in the public interest to take prosecutorial action in an individual case or to amend prosecution policy in the public interest will depend very much on the particular facts and circumstances of a particular case or policy proposal. It is an assessment which involves careful consideration of all the relevant public interests. In an individual case, that may include, for example, the nature and gravity of the offence, the impact of the offence on the victim and other witnesses, and the age, background, and personal circumstances of the accused. The factors which will require to be taken into account and the weight to be given to each factor will depend on the circumstances of each case. In an individual case, consideration of the public interest arises only if there is sufficient evidence. A non-exhaustive list of factors which may, depending on the circumstances, be relevant when assessing the public interest in the context of a prosecutorial decision is included in the publicly available Scottish Prosecution Code. Adam Tonkins. I thank the Lord Advocate for that answer. Earlier this uh, month, presiding officer, it was announced that the Lord Advocate will not suspend the operation of our drugs laws to enable a fix room to operate in Glasgow. I very warmly welcome that decision. But can the Lord Advocate explain to the Parliament his reasoning as to why this conclusion is in his judgment in the public interest? Lord Advocate. Yes, I, sh I should make clear that the proposals for a safe drug consumption facility principally pursue public health objectives. And so it's a matter for health officials to assess the public interest in implementing such proposals and to determine how they would operate in practice. Uh, I've not been asked to assess uh, whether the proposals are in the public interest in any, uh, in any general sense. A request was made to me by the Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership to consider amending prosecution policy to facilitate the operation of a safe drug consumption facility. I responded to the partnership on the 9th of November, advising them that even were I minded to, the granting of immunity from relevant statutory or common law offences would not enable the operation of the facilities and identifying that there are difficulties both of principle and practicality in responding positively to the particular request that was made to me. Uh, no change has been made to prosecution policy as, as a result of the request and no immunity from prosecution granted uh, in respect of any uh, offence. Thank you very much.